This is the Brooklyn Rails 565th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, the program's associate here at the Rail, and I have the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Raul de Nieves and Will Corwin. And we're really thrilled to welcome poet Cor Alia Ahmed here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a working document of some resources and actions. Today's conversation will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel where you can view the full archive of the series. And now to introduce our guest and host, Raul de Nieves' visual symbolism draws on cl classical Catholic and Mexican vernacular motifs to create his own unique mythology that challenges and explores themes of sexuality, the human body, and individual and public histories. Having learned traditional Latin American sewing and beadwork at school and alongside family, his work pays tribute to and invents upon traditional forms. De Nieves has had solo exhibitions at ICA Boston, MOCA Miami, and numerous other institutions. And he has performed at Documenta 14 and MoMA PS1, among many other venues. William Corwin is a sculptor and journalist who has exhibited at galleries in New York, London, Hamburg, Beijing, and Taipei. He has written regular, regularly for the Brooklyn Rail, Art Papers, Bomb, Art Critical, Rain Taxi, and Canvas. Most recently, he curated and wrote the catalog for post-war women at the Art Students League in New York. He's the editor of Formalism, collected essays of Saul Ostra. Um, and with that, thank you all really so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you, Will. Hello. Um, it's really uh, a great honor and very exciting to be able to talk with Raul. Um, I encourage everyone to go see um, Carnage, uh, Carnage Composition, which is open till June 11th at a company gallery. Um, I wanted to start uh, by asking you uh, a question about a quote that I, I pulled from a, a wonderful interview you did a couple of years ago from uh, in Bomb Magazine, Brian Chittis. Um, I loved it. I thought you, you said, I try to find the inner demons that give my thoughts pleasure. Um, and I wanted to just ask you to expand on that sort of general framework for making art. Um, and, and I mean, just expand on that. And then I, I, I have some follow -up questions about that. But uh, the inner demons that give you pleasure, how does that, how does that work? I mean, I feel like, you know, through every day, we find ourselves asking us questions about what it is that we're going through and how we deal with things. So for me, I feel like, you know, the best way to kind of, you know, sum up that quote is that um, not every day is perfect, you know, and then there's days that, you know, seem harder than others not just through my own personal experiences, but whatever's going on in the world. Um, and sometimes I feel like, you know, when I really want to reach out and kind of create a conversation, not just with like my psyche, but whatever's going around me, I think that's when I'm really like trying to bring in that information and that energy into whatever is happening. So it's mainly about just really being aware of like how um, things are going around and, and what I can do to either like ease myself into um, just an everyday action. Hmm. That's maybe I'm reading too much in, but I see this like immediate sort of contrast between demon and pleasure. And I was curious if you're kind of positioning yourself or the artist as immediately sort of a transgressive, a demonic figure is trying to kind of well I think we were even talking about that like like sort out right off of... yeah I mean I feel like you know the demon is actually maybe the one that's like put to shame when like hmm. maybe they're really like showing themselves who they really are and maybe that's why they're 
demonized. Um, you know, who's who's to say that like the hierarchy isn't the demon or or the angels? So um, I try to look at things with a, a, like a dual perspective of how we um, like you know these these uh, titles have been put upon people or experiences. So I don't know, like even looking at this work, there is all the sense of these um, maybe skeletons or demons, but are they the ones that we should be afraid of? Or is it more like these realistic looking people that are kind of, um, you know, more normal lives or something? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, of the show, uh, I was very, the, the layout is, uh, is kind of amazing. It's, uh, it's, it's three rooms and there's a main room, which we're looking at now. And then on either side are these two smaller chambers. And uh, it, I, I felt it would be great to enter into both, but through the main entrance and you're by this figure, Timothy. Um, and then you have the main room. And then on the other side, you have Lord, which is another sort of figurative culture. And in the middle, you have um, this sort of inner sanctum, which has the cross and in front of the cross is sort of this transfigured uh, um, uh, which is called the deaths of every day, um, which you can see there on, I guess it's my left, but the, the green figure in the, in the metal structure. And, um, how did you, what was, I, I, how did you want the viewer to experience this, this layout? What was, what was your sort of idea of the progression? It's sort of half church, half horror film, but I was like curious what your, what your intention was there laying it out. Well, the way that I was trying to kind of maybe create a narrative is that Timothy is found this place or this sanctuary or this new, you know, this, this new world. Um, and in a way, like these uh, panels or screens, however you'd want to call them, there are these two different forms of making um, a painting or a, you know, some sort of recorded um, experience. And for me, when I started making this work, it was also an investigation to this freedom of what it means to like kind of let go and use just formalism or gestures to create work. So these white um, topographical maps, maybe you could call them, are an investigation of just um, gestures of abstract, like, you know, uh, ways of, of doing things. So Timothy really is this seeker to wanting to kind of figure out what it is that they're experiencing. And then through that, it's almost like they find that there's already this world that exists. So mm -hmm through these images and the flies and the deaths of every day, I feel like it is this stepping ground to, to realizing maybe what it, it is to kind of like have this pleasure dome with your inner sanctum demons and um, how, how does that look and what does that feel like? You know, when I was thinking about the deaths of every day, I was, I was really just also experiencing different, um, just different modes of making things and seeing that at points when you're trying to conceive an idea and it doesn't work out as it's supposed to be planned, those moments of, of like an accident or despair really create this investigation of trying to get to know better what it is that you're doing. You know, um, this sculpture really had pretty much like multiple lives at one point and it and when I started working on it it was a completely different idea that I had to almost like rip apart in order to kind of get to this place where the work is now on this metal structure that could somewhat signify this decayed um, form of you know, um, like a house or, or they're like growing into this tree or, or whatever you want to think of it. Um, but 
it really kind of gave me this experience to just uh, see time really show you what um, things will end up looking like, you know, and I feel like for for us that are like trying to conceive um, these modes of, of expression, there is this moment where you have some sort of like control, but in a way to kind of let go of that control, it's almost like more like finding this guidance. And so in a way, these characters, the, the Lord and Timothy are almost like this really investigation of creation. And even through understanding what it is that you're doing, it also just develops through itself. You know, um, a lot of these works really did not have um, a set structure of what they were supposed to turn out to be. Um, but in a way, they just um, almost unfolded themselves, you know? And even when I was thinking about this idea of, um, you know, like the screens are called the book of hours and how many hours in the day they are and what we choose to do with, with our time. It's, there's, there's times where you're, I mean, when we're sleeping, we're still kind of like working. Um, but sometimes when you're awake, it's almost like when you're, you feel like you have less control because you're so present to your everyday surroundings. And maybe that's also what it, it was like to have this idea of a death of every day, you know, that it, it really gives you this um, chance to, to think of a, a full circle and to start all over again, you know, and to really realize that that is a personal freedom to really give yourself that structure that through, through our ways of trying to just go by day by day, we have these moments where we can get to know ourselves better, you know, or, or even just through conversations like this, it allows you to, to realize that there's more that you're actually trying to figure it out. So this show really has been such an incredible experience to make because not only um, was this, it, it, you know, this was a realization of, of an idea and it all started with thinking about making these uh, multiples of the flies and how mm -hmm. the fly to me really symbolizes this form of um, vulnerability, you know, to, to really think of like, this reproductive system that is used and then the waste that comes out of it is almost like the nurturing to somebody else. Hmm. Wow, okay, so you've opened like five different doors. Um, yeah. And I, I kind of want to ask about each of them. Uh, and it, it re you, you have said, uh, I noticed, you know, I, you've said it, it, when I work, that's when most of the thinking happens. Um, which I'm very interested in the process. And I guess we can sum it up. Uh, oh, my God. My, can you hear me all right? You're a little crackly. Oh, God. Am I a little crackly? Yeah, okay, you're a little, on, a little glitchy. Okay. Oh, God. All right. Let's see. Okay. Um, the digital board. <laughs> It intrudes. <laughs> um. Well, I can walk you through. We can walk you through joining from your phone if you want. Um, um, would that sure. be helpful? I mean, I can, yeah, exactly. I can. Let me see if I can do that. That might be easier. OK. I mean, in the meantime, maybe Raul, would you be able to say more about um, Timothy, the Timothy piece? Yeah, so the Timothy piece is, I mean, it's its really fun to kind of think about how this work came about too. It, it was a mannequin that had been sitting at my friend's house for so many years and they actually um, gave him the name Timothy and she brought him over once. And um, I think when I started making like these objects for the show, like I wanted to kind of go back to this tactile form of how I started making work and you know, growing up in Mexico, I got to see these wonderful people make such beautiful things on the street, 
um, and they were so mystical. They were, they're the Huicholas and they're, um, they're th these beautiful people that dress in these outfits that represent really their life and culture. Um, and they do these yarn paintings that um, supposedly, you know, after their peyote experiences, they have these visions. So I think that's another reason why Timothy is this almost like he, he's in conquest to, to self-realize something new. Um, he's an excavator, you know, he's, he's wearing this helmet that uh, gives you the idea of an astronaut or some sort of like way of thinking. And um, I don't know, like his, his means of creation really did come from this almost like very simple gesture of just taking these materials and transforming them, which is just a simple set of ropes, um, coiling them over and over again until they become really decorative in this way that almost like it's not a decorative form, but it's almost like this, uh, when I think about like repetition and how it comes in my work, it really does have this um, almost like very zen quality of just seeing this mode of going in a circle or or, or bringing things up and down and how they really just become so organic in their own sense. Um, so, you know, and, and up until now, it's when all these kind of uh, themes come about because when I'm making these, these objects, there really are just this form of freedom, you know? And, and the beauty of it is that they, they do start to relate more as things come along. But also like for me, it's really important that the viewer just gets a sense of also like an understanding of what they think that this object really symbolic, symbolically um, comes together within an exhibition or if he's taken apart from this set of work, like how does he relate on its own? Is Will back? Am I back? Hello. Will I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can hear you, yeah. Okay, great. Um, I, I guess I wanted to talk about your process, but um, I, the, the everyday deaths piece, the deaths of every day, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Um, the deaths of every day piece, if, if there's any way to get that back, you, you, you talked about your process being sort of, uh, something that happens as you're working on it. And you said that this piece had gone through many, many sort of iterations where it was completely different from what it began with. Um, and I wanted to ask you just, can you walk us through that, the process a bit? I mean, because it has so many possible interpretations of, you know, of Exactly. The, I mean, you know, when I, was, when I first started working on this, this piece was meant to be a part of another series of works that um, are currently on view at the ICA Boston um, for my show, The Treasure House of Memories. So each one of these mares where, or, so there's like one large horse and then three mares. And then from the beginning, this piece was titled like the abyss. So it's like, the darkest part of the world that we can't even realize. So it, to me, I think it was still this idea of like trying to kind of fully understand why I was focusing on, on like this unknown way of making things. And through the, through the making of this object, it, it really just needed to have more of like a real life experience. Um, so there was there was like a point where it got damaged and through through shipping formats and you know when it came back I could have just fixed it to be what it was supposed to be but I think even just thinking about like this um, unknown territory which is like to just pull things apart and then relearn from the mistakes of what you think happened. So 
that also symbolized this idea of like a death that continues to happen, but with a form of re like reviving itself. Um, also, this work really allowed me to, you know, fully expand my way of making things. And I was able to work with the fabricator to create this structure. And even when I was working with the fabricator, I, at the whole time, I wanted almost like this idea to be caged in, but not in a form of like a, a bird cage or, or, or a jail. So um, we kind of abstractly made this construction out of wood and then just replicated it in the steel. And it, it really gave me this understanding of growth, you know, because um, through seeing something have, it was almost like when you break an arm, how long it takes you to fix that problem. And your body is really just connecting, your, your whole psyche is really connecting into that, that part of your body that needs that healing process. So this work really became a healing process to me. And I think it really allowed for this exhibition to come about. If, if the accident had not happened, this whole body of work, I don't think would have happened. You know, these abstract panels would have, have not been there. Um, and, and this visceral quality of this work really just um, kind of exuberated from a performative way of making things and then seeing this thing perform its own like you know death and its own revival then um, so the process of making these things is just very uh very time consuming but in a way you know i think it also allows me to relate to the things that are happening around me and to really put that energy back into the work because when you're doing this uh repetitive bead kind of work almost like every day is a time clock to its own self and you know there'll be like sections of the piece that remind me of what it was like to kind of feel that despair and that energy really goes locked into it. Um, so in a way, like these kind of natural accidents really are almost like the driving force to how the work really comes about. Otherwise, I think it would, it would have been this repetitive way of, of seeing things mm. in my own perspective. Well, it's fascinating when you, when you investigate the surface, um, I just found myself getting really, I mean, it was sort of like being on some kind of hallucinogenic uh, substance. You get really into the surface. And I noticed that, I mean, it's hard to tell in the images here for everyone looking, but the sort of the orange and white bits are actually these kind of fake, like Victorian sort of brooches with little faces on them. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, as I was looking, I, I was really beginning to, 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 to sort of compare them and, and look at how you assemble them. And again, based on your process, and as you said, it's this kind of ongoing everyday process of beating these things. How, do, how did you sort of assemble this collection? Is, do you, are you kind of like Joseph Cornell with these like boxes of different colors or is it kind of a, do you go out and, and, and examine, you know, do you say, I'm looking for green beads and I do you sketch it out beforehand? How does that how does that process work? Um, there definitely is no sketching within any of my work. Um, you know, because I find that even when I'm like drawing, I become so like invested in it that the sketch turns into a body of work or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of these, like, you know, through the beads. Yes, there is, I can, I can obviously allocate like the special type of bead, but these Victorian uh, cameos that you talk about, they were a gift from a friend who um, had a whole backstock of these cameos and I've had them in my studio for years. I didn't know how to use them because they're quite awkward. Um, you know, and they do have this like kitsch quality to them. But I think 
when I started thinking about them um, and how I could accumulate them, they, they did start to really symbolize this idea of the particle, you know, or this like mushroom growing onto this object. So almost like these, these plastic uh, reproduced cameos really do become this form of almost like this disease that's like maybe taking over the piece or are the beads really the ones that are like overgrowing onto this uh, surface. So mm -hmm. it really kind of, I mean, the organic forms that come about are because it is a rep rep uh, repetitive way of making things, you know? And I, I, and I found that, that even just through investigating like I mean, the most beautiful things in, in nature are because, you know, something is hitting up against it or, or, or it's just this time that's developing these new relationships with different um, forms of living. And um, it kind of all is about just using an intuitive way of um, looking at things and, and just letting time kind of guide you to how it is that this piece will have its own growth, you know, because I can keep like the, the beauty of this stuff is that you can keep working on it over and over again. And obviously it can be this, this form of like a never ending process. You know, I've had works that are in my studio sitting for seven years and it's not that I'm working on them for seven years. It's just, the long span of time of when I thought that this didn't need any more of my time is when I feel like maybe it's completed. But um, the fun of it is that it really kind of has this want for more of my time. And, you know, through sitting in front of this sculpture, The Death of Every Day, it's, it's, it was a almost a two year process of of kind of trying to figure out how to fix this problem. And maybe it was also like a personal problem that I was going through or the pandemic and what it was making me feel like, this despair of every day, the feeling that I couldn't come, you know, be amongst the way that I used to think life was and how to adapt to a whole new world. Um, so like these works really do become like these platforms of like self-realization for myself. Hmm. It's the, the, the idea of the beads kind of being life and being these, these sort of, uh, I don't know, microbes or bacteria or something to grow and then that they interact with each other and have a life of their own. I remember you had a, a wonderful installation at the Swiss Institute. Um, I think it was called Humility. Mm -hmm. um, and it was... Uh, it was the flies. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the flies, but the flies had somehow become infected with the beads. And I don't think we have an image of that, but I, in, in this particular, in this exhibition, Carnage Collision, you have two kinds of flies. And I, I was sort of struck because I was, the, some of the flies are darker, but then there was one fly on the wall. I don't, I don't know if you recall this one specific fly, but like you could only, um, recognize it because it was a shadow. It somehow was invisible and you just saw the yeah. shadow of the fly. I thought that was absolutely amazing. But then going through, you know, remembering your, your pieces over the years, um, humility really struck me because that was this very, it was the, again, the flies had somehow gotten infected by the beads. And yeah. it's kind of, where, when did the fly symbol first emerge? Because you say that it, it you know, the fly devours things. It kind of is a, a, a means of creating more life, but obviously also, and, and we, we should st start talking about like Catholic imagery at some point, but it also represents a demonic force, right? Beelzebub is the sort of the demon of flies. What, and you create this, this crucifix in the middle of the room with flies. So talk a bit about the, the fly symbolism, where it, when, it, when you first started thinking about it and, and how, it, how you use it. Well, I think we can all relate to the fly with like a form of annoyance. And, you know, when there's a fly in your house, you're like, how do I get rid of this? Or I had a studio that um, had a backyard and there was a mulberry tree. Um, and every summer the, the berries would fall to the ground and just ferment. 
So it would at attract this, these swarms of flies. So my studio was constantly like, there was, it was like this invitation for these flies to have their own party. And, you know, I was so annoyed because I, every time I, I like can't kill a fly because they're, they were just so big and, and juicy and like, ugh, it was just so gross. But I started to kind of relate to the fly because at one point it was like a really hot summer day. And I mean, I was probably drinking a beer or something. And then I noticed that this fly was like sucking the juice out of this berry and it was having the time of its life and it pretty much was drunk. And I think that's when I just really like zoned in on, on this aspect of life. And it's almost like we were both laughing at each other because maybe we were doing the same thing. And that's when I started to really relate more or use this fly as a, as a form of symbolism. And the fly really started to come um, very prominent in my practice when, I was invited to do the Whitney Biennial and created this large scale stained glass piece. And when I was trying to think of like the imagery that would go onto that mural, I, I wanted the swarm of flies to be a prominence of life. You know, at that point, um, I was really thinking about like, all of the energy that was really being cir like circulated through the world when Trump was administrative and how people reacted to this pretty much horrible aspect of life. Um, but the fly really just started to symbolize this, this way of thinking about the small aspects of our experiences of every day and how we do get, um, you know, a chance to kind of re, re show ourselves something new. And so the fly right here forming this crucifix really once again wants to take over this traditional way of thinking. This cross doesn't really necessarily need to symbolize a Catholic form of way of thinking, but also in this specific context, the fly really took on this vulnerability of wanting to regenerate this idea of spiritualism and, and a guidance, you know, and, and this form of, of a takeover. Like, it's time for us to take back what we know belongs to us, you know, to, to really feel that freedom to be like, you know what, I'm going to wear a cross because it symbolizes me being I don't know what, you know, to every person is something different. But for me, even my mother coming to the show and looking at this image of, of a swarm of flies and, and we did grow up Catholic, but, you know, through, through my experience of, of having this person in my life, um, you know, me coming out as a homosexual at one point, and now even just thinking about what homosexuality means and how we define ourselves, it's almost like there was times where these systems were, were pushing me to think that I was at wrong, you know? Hmm. But now it's almost like we are new saviors because through our experiences, we are opening up people's perspectives of life. Um, so, the symbol of the fly is this very vulnerable aspect of, of rethinking. Hmm. That, was, that was something that occurred to me with the stained glass works, especially uh, the piece of the Whitney Biennial, which was uh, beginning and the end, neither and the otherwise betwixt and between the end is the beginning and the end, um, which was this sort of spectacular panoply of, um, depiction of, I thought it was like the garden of early, earthly delights, but it was sort of the garden of earthly delights depicted as a positive thing, not as usually in the medieval sense, a kind of sinful. Um, but it, it did, I began to think, you know, do you feel that you're getting too close to kind of church forms? I mean, like stained glass, like you're in a way you're, you're you know, are you re, re, establishing them by trying to reject them. What is your, how, what do you, what is your feeling about that? Do you feel trapped into having to kind of 
reiterate Catholic forms and, and styles. That's something like personally to you. How does that how does that work for you? Um, I think it's fun, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I think um, obviously the to me, like these are traditional ways of, of looking at art. And these are very old ways of seeing picture making happen. And the stained glass really was an accident of my practice. You know, like mm -hmm. I never really, I mean, it's not even stained glass that you're looking at. It's, it's collage making. Um, these are just pieces of mylar with tape, you know, um, supported by, you know, these simple frames of wood. Um, and what actually really, I think the beauty of this, um, you know, we want to call them like transparent paintings, if we must, um, mm -hmm. they really have allowed me to just expand my my way of making work and to relating to space. And I think maybe that's why also like stained glass really did exist. It's not only was it this form of way like relating to like the, the you know, the, the gods and then like earth and then experience. And, you know, when I think about the stained glass really reacting to its own, like these, these beautiful aspects of and experiences that when these things are activated by natural daylight, it's a dance, you know, you see it come and go. And it really forms this, this beautiful aspect of experience. So, I mean, you know, it is really interesting to think about what these like kind of almost archaic ways of, of seeing work be represented in a contemporary form. Um, I'm, I am a very, you know, uh, like spiritual person I go to church I I have no like you know I think it's probably more punk to admit that you that you believe in some sort of something other than yourself and these sacred spaces really do create an understanding of how you know people come together and how people are rejected from these uh, places and how you can once again, cross that door and, and prove to yourself that you belong wherever you think you belong. Um, so, you know, it's, for me, it's really beautiful to think about. I mean, when I was a child, this is, these were the first things that I saw that really moved me. You know, there was a Christ in my town that people would come like once a year on their knees to not even be able to touch it, but to be amongst it because they felt that they would really be saved by this piece of wood. And I was always so interested in how people would react and go and like visit this thing. And it almost had more power every year because it was getting all this life and energy from people. And so I think, you know, when I started making work, I really wanted to connect back to that feeling. You know, my work really does take me a long time to create. And I do have these very am amazing experiences with the practice. You know, I, I feel so, so free, but I can also put all this energy back into it for it to kind of create the sense of beauty. You know, at the end, I really want things to, to be beautiful, you know, like beauty to me is very important because beauty is an experience. Hmm. And this, this piece on, on the, uh, that's up on the screen right now uh, is a nice sort of segue to the sort of further question about it, but um, this, this idea of Catholic imagery and your Originally, Mexico. Um, and also in the Book of Hours, piece, that's accordion uh, series of screens. There's uh, a lot of there's a lot of interest a sort of intersection between mythologies. So you have Catholic mythology, and I felt I, I could see uh, Mexican mythology, but I'm not sure. So I want that's I want to ask you. Uh, I noticed that in one part of the the book of hours, there's a figure where a tree is growing out, but the tree is actually maize. Mm -hmm. And I, I was curious, did you invent some of this imagery? Or are you pulling it straight from 
from sort of memories of growing up? What, what is, and, and, and then again, this piece, Lord, makes me think of, of uh, imagery from, say, Mayan, Mayan painting, where you have these sort of amazing headdresses on these sort of lords and, and figures of power and gods within that sort of mythological context. So I'm, I'm curious where you're pulling your mythological imagery uh, besides the Catholic background. Well, it, it kind of is just coming from, I don't know. I mean, my, my like imagination is so wild at points that uh, like, I, I, you know, even looking at Lord right now, it's so interesting to see how at the end they do become these characters that are just pretty much invented. You know, like the corn came about because when I was thinking about maybe also like just this form of colonization, like I wanted to use the corn as a symbol of the time that's changed, you know, and and in the in the in the book of hours, like the corn really is this form of like uh, it's 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 the food, you know, it's this like quality of life, and this person reading a book that's pretty much dreaming of this whole experience is just also like trying to become one with itself. So, I mean, when I was drawing these, uh, these panels, they, they really just were kind of guiding me to, to where they needed to be. Like, yes, I do look at like a lot of books, like Alder, like just like, you know, and I, I mean, imagery just comes from imagination, you know? And I think that's part of, once again, to put all these images together at the end, it's like, it's really interesting to see how they kind of do at the end relate, like this image that we're looking at right now with this portal, that's, that was the last of these panels that were drawn. And I was trying to figure out how to finish this suite of works and, and this idea of like this person like resting and reading and kind of thinking about like the past and the present. Um, it was kind of like this idea of the portal, you know, to really, to really allow itself to just kind of throw yourself in there into the void and come out and then be able to tell the story. I mean, Right now, all of these questions and answers are because I'm trying to also articulate what it is that I'm doing without meaning, you know, but all of this has a really personal meaning because it is, for me, this exhibition is the new beginning of something that I've been trying to let go of. My work has been so rooted within my family experiences and me growing up in Mexico and and coming to the Americas and finding a new life. And I've been celebrating that in so many different ways, but like carnage composition is this visceral way of being like, how do I start all over again and create a new story from the beginning to see where it actually will take me? So this, this body of work is an understanding of, you know, something, something is changing, not just in outside of me but even in our world you know like we're getting to understand new ways of living new ways of technology and new forms of religions you know and new forms of identity everything seems we're so lucky that we're getting to be a part of this time because history is showing us a real change and i i, I like how even so, you say it's all about change, but you, you still have the shoes. I mean, these original objects that you started with years ago find their way in mm -hmm. and, and so you don't let go of them, um, which I think is, you know, there's sort of these magnificent, and it takes a moment and you look and then you realize these are the shoes and they've kind of grown, but they're, they're still there. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's a morbid question to ask you because you seem to have such a, a vibrant view of it, what is, what is your, how do you negotiate death through your sculpture? Because I feel like, as you said, times are changing. There's a sort of fluidity of, of life and, and gender and, 
identity. And so how does that fit into the context of, of an end where you're kind of navigating between a Catholic imagery of the end or an ideology of the end and then a kind of new idea? What is your vision? How does that? Well, I feel like because um, growing up and, you know, my father passed away when we were young, um, life became so beautiful, I think, because of his death. And life gave us an opportunity to really find these angels or or this guidance from love and experience, you know. And it, it's I'm 38 years old, and you know my mom was just here to to view the show. And obviously, we've talked about my father's death in such an open way. But as an adult, I hadn't had a conversation with my mom about what actually happened because I knew what had happened, but I had made a whole story in my head. And so when I asked her, could you just tell me what that day was like for you? It was like a bomb exploded and it just reintroduced this new relationship with my mother and a new relationship to the death of my father. And, you know, sometimes my mom can be so morbid and be like, well, I might die tomorrow. And then I'm like, well, I'll laugh, you know, like in this, in this act of joy, like obviously it's, it's one of the saddest things we can experience within our lives. But in a way, it also is this beautiful way of letting go and introducing a whole new, new way of living. So my relationship to death is very personal and the shoes are a memento mori, you know, they're, they're these beautiful, um, these shoes were all worn by me. And the reason why they exist is because the shoe had a death. And instead of discarding it, it's almost like I celebrated it with this, this way of making things. And the shoe really, um, allows me to kind of remember what it was when I wanted to just learn how to make art. And that's why they always are in my exhibitions because I have, I, you know, it's so funny. Yesterday I was hanging out with my friends and they were cleaning out their closet and they had this bag of shoes that they were ready to throw out. And I was like, please let me take your shoes. And I've never made art from somebody else's shoes, but I was like, wow, like my next show is, is going to be about David and Solomon, you know, like, and it's just so cool to think about how these objects really will influence a new body of work through somebody else's experience. But if we want to wrap up that question, like, you know, um, the, the act of, of losing someone is, an act of gaining something new. Hmm. And it, it's, it's sort of hard to ignore the fact that with the shoes, these are objects that are meant to be worn and move. And much of your work is about costume and clothing and moving bodies and living bodies. And so I was, again, not to keep bringing up sort of what I feel are like sort of interesting contradictions for you, but moving to sculpture, from sort of a performative, I like, how was it to, to sort of create all these objects that are static when so much of your kind of uh, creativity is about movement and sound and, and, and how does that, how did that initially work for you when you said, well, I'm gonna start making sculptures? You know, well, frozen? you know, when I, when I started making these shoes, they, they were made to be worn, mm -hmm. but I, I was still feeling that maybe the function was taking away more of this uh, investigation of notions. So when I started to take the function uh, away from the wearability of specifically the shoe, it's when it kind of just was allowing to do its own experience. And I think it's still this form of desire because I look at these shoes and I'm like, I wish I could put you on, you know, like, but I'm like, maybe just this desire to wishing or wanting to be inside of you is like something that we desire through an everyday function. The costumes on the other hand, 
um, like Lord, he can be fully activated. You know, um, right now he's just obviously in a standpoint, but that work is, um, you know, this is a very simple uh, worker. So like the way that I make these, they're they're made from like just old worker suits that then get embellished. Um, and the beauty of these works is that they do create sound and movement, you know, like what Kostin does. And it also gives you this opportunity to create yourself into this mystical character. Um, wearing these things is this very, uh, you know, hard thing to put on. It's not easy, but I think that's also like the, the beauty of it that sometimes clothing isn't the easiest to wear. And when you want to wear the most uncomfortable pairs of shoes or like some really crazy, I don't know, thing and you feel so out of your body, it's when you kind of like become more yourself in a way. And so have you have you worn Lord? In my studio, yeah. <laughs> and you just kind of walk around or does does Lord have a, a movement or a a story behind them what is what is lord's personality i think lord is this enchanting character that could lure, lure you into doing something that maybe you don't want to do but maybe that you've been wanting to do for a long time um but i think it's also like this uh you know, I recently just got a dog and like, after I got my dog, it, my dog opened like every portal of my life that I felt like I was always like, I should do that, but maybe I'll just wait. So now I'm like, no, no more waiting. Like I, I have the responsibility to do anything I desire. So almost like Lord, that's what, you know, he is this character that maybe is pushing you to be like, let go of yourself and just go for it, you know? Like, come with me and you can be a better person. I don't know, like, mm. so he's definitely that kind of like menacing, but like, you know, you're like afraid. It's almost like when you want to do something, there's this fear that holds you back because you're like, don't know what it'll do, but it's almost like he's like taking fear away from an experience. Hmm. And sort of a, as a final question, I know in, in 2014, you did a, an opera mm -hmm. piece with Colin Self. Yeah. Um, are you, is, is, are there any more performative pieces sort of in the works that you're, you're planning? Well, right now, like, you know, I've been in the, I've been in this musical group for 10 years, Hairbone, and we've, taken a hiatus because of which by the way which you can see on your instagram feed yeah I'd like yeah to point that out if you want um, to hear, hear them yeah, yeah but um through on june 9th um we will have a performance night at the gallery so it's gonna include three different people so we'll see what happens but yeah like the opera with colin really also just came about this form of conversations and that's where beginning and the end, neither and the other ones, betwixt and between, the end is the beginning. That's where this title came about. Because we were like, we, we, we found ourselves like going in circles about thinking of the character as the fool as this form of experience. And that the fool had this beginning and it always had an end, but as it ended, it just began a new notion. So, um, right now like i've been going to see so much music like even more than ever and bands that i don't even know because i just want to feel that energy once again of what it was like to to be kind of in a room with people that are there for the same reason which is to pretty much give themselves to this performer you know and to be taken back by like this experience of coming together hmm. Well, well, I guess uh, turn it over to Carolyn to uh, perhaps take some questions from, from the viewers. Thank you, Lynn. That was a great conversation. Yeah, it was wonderful. Thanks. Very, very moving.
Yeah, I'm so, so grateful. Yeah, we got to hear from you both. Um, definitely everyone will say this ad nauseum, but please see the show in person. The pictures just don't do Until so June much 11. Yes. justice. Right. 145 um, Elizabeth Street. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so oh, great. Oh, gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. First, I would love to turn it over to our friend G.E. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute to ask your question. Okay, great. Thank you so much. This is uh, so amazing on so many different levels that, that touch me and, and just excite me so much. And I thank you. And I thank you, William, for, for, for helping to, to guide us through this, too. Question, do you, do you, do you see the cross as kind of a linking of up, the upright line and the horizontal line, the active with the passive or receptive? And how when two forces are combined, fusioning kind of into a third force or entity, uh, creating kind of the, you know, these, these other sexual, psychological and spiritual levels? Yeah, I mean, I think that's also why you know, the cross became so prominent in this exhibition is that it's really telling of all these different ways and axes of who we are. And um, the beauty of this symbol is that it's so charged, you know, and it's so charged with this very kind of dark understanding of life. You know, the cross doesn't exist because it was this beautiful object. The cross was used to crucify someone, to put to death, you know, but it's one of the most recognizable ways of like thinking of purity, but it was never pure because it was a torture device. Right. So it's almost like these flies are either cleaning that or, 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 or also, you know, bringing in that notion. So what I've been thinking about the cross is that it is this really intense, symbol that was used to kill someone <laughs> and now it's like the holiest of all <laughs> but and it also but it extends out in so in two different directions that almost can encompass the entire cosmos too if they keep going yeah and then circling back so it, it, but it is wonderful and i'm so glad you you brought this to the show thank you thank you Thank you so much, GE, for that question. Um, next, we'd love to turn it over to Lynn. You can go ahead and unmute. Thank you. This conversation was so amazing. Um, I think I'm up there somewhere right now, <laughs> levitating. Um, one of the things that strikes me as you talk about your work is this really, <clears throat> excuse me, intricate blend of of um, the fantastic with with the with the practical, um, th they seem to be interwoven, and I just am curious if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, I think even just when when people uh, also explain my work, and it's like, oh, Raul is bringing these notions of like high drag and like the fantasy of it all. I feel like you know through I mean even just through music, it's what, it's really elevated my way of thinking. Mm. And not even just the, the music that's coming out, but the musician itself, this, this uh, beautiful person that creates this almost way of thinking and dressing. And it's almost like that we have that uber fantastical person within ourselves. It's just mm. hard to sometimes bring out, you know? And I think that's, why apparel has become so important within my practice is because I use apparel as a form of expression. It's always shown to the world, maybe who I am, you know, through a character, but deep inside, like I feel just as I wear. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. A lot, a lot to mine here. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, next, I'd love to turn it over to Raven. Has a question. Hi. Okay. So my my I was really curious to know more about uh, your influences and what your process was like, and uh, like what gets you 
you know, ready and motivated to create the pieces that you have also about like, you know, like what inspires you. So, you know, your influences and whatnot. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, it's, I'm obviously influenced by every artist that, you know, we can think of, like they've, you know, I mean, as simple as Salvador Dali, like changed my life when I was reading their biography because of their really eccentric ways of living. But I'm right now, like, I think I'm just so influenced by my peers because I'm living in this time where I am also seeing my friends come about and and really change the way we see things. So um, New York has been such a great platform to be a part of, you know, it's, it's really brought me closer and closer to people that I never thought would become part of my life. And so I think the encouragement of seeing others work is what really is moving me also to, to get up and, and do my thing. Any musical influences that, you know? Yeah, so like right now, musical influences, I'm, I don't know what happened to my life, but I'm like addicted to techno music. <laughs> I guess because it, it never has an ending, you know, like you go to these techno shows and you're, so, I mean, there's not specifically one, but um, I, I, I mean, I love Philip Glass and, you know, I've, I've been able to see a lot of his work and I'm gonna go see the opera um, that's playing right now here in New York, um, but, I don't know, like I've been going to St. Vitus a lot to see metal bands and just also the prodigy of like the construction of this music is so mathematical that you're like, wow, like how are these people like up there just like screaming their guts and like, I don't know, it sounds so like chaotic, but beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, that's so beautiful. I'm glad St. Vitus is still yeah. <laughs> doing its thing post <laughs> pandemic um well yeah i think that was it for our questions thank you so much um for such beautiful answers i'm so excited to introduce our poet today uh, we have core with us core alia ahmed is a writer and artist living in brooklyn they make videos drawings poems and plays their work has been shown with insert in interstate projects, 77 Mulberry, Alyssa Davis Gallery, Rhizome, Bomb, and their manuscript is forthcoming from Wendy's Subway. So be sure to look out for that. And I'd love to turn it over to you, Corey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was really beautiful. And so nice to have like visuals to follow along with too. Is my sound okay? It's good. Okay, I'm gonna read maybe three poems, some shorter, and then we'll see what time is like. Orange peel here, forget me not, original speak, missing dare, cut the tree into ribs, collide the strands in flight, chest eyes, pompous to think you could name a star, Fermented the community, betray magic, answer time, love by inhalation. Pretend the danger snaps to grid, believe in linear, roll, jump, dream. Like the machine is equal, like the wand is the form for the wand. Find your devastation in the dewdrop. The tips of my ears, cat cow, like dun, 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 dun. But unwanting for end, my hips hop full circle. You're pulsing, you're promising. It was a purple night. I raise my palms up slowly as if I could drag wax across my vision, starting to stay as moss to loosen. Jay turns to me, caught like I didn't just see her doing that, gazing with a pang. The leather clings to her taut torso like mercury. Bubblegum, the want to touch her, and the lines of the music squiggle vertical blood on the veins of her muscles. Look how hard I'm into you. Is it just music what this produces? A frog begs me, a lesion croons me. 
nudges crush change, a light touch upon me, a platform for the map on the palm, re-truth, vision on the little tub of lubrication, toes stick out for cold air. What hint of herbal flavor, merguez, nascent edit, forgiven by pollen, crumbs of a spring afternoon, cruel to leave the moment as ash, a cautionary tale, leave something behind, make waves to trace that that could look more curious, to have it and then to belt it with patterned stars, ample bell, impeccable shadow, ice edges, a blue image of hints, suggestions, not of anything that should, but anything that could. A ray of surmise, a puddle dragged by purpose. Caution, where is caution? Woken under melody. A creeping cactus, rooted thorns, the bottom blanket, the stained sheet. Thank that mist pool with direct contact. Fingers rinsed twice and positioned to weave new forces upon the day. Ice that made that last step spell glamour. A wet thought, shapes, sound, lullaby, candelabra, abruptly sprouted brassicas, arms open to test my wingspan against your heart's flutter. Actual vessel, vessel in votive, carve a place, bruise the melancholy steps, mark fruited murmurs of want and loss. A lark soars knowingly over the picture. Catch, place, and render it ochre. Woven tightly, only one reigns. You will be better off when they leave, always miss them forever. Is it just music, what this produces? Maybe one more? Yeah. Okay. Make pigeons of your truth. If forging this whole, I'll fill you with what I can give. At least light, at best force. Crack the ancient code of this plane. The very angle, the missing tooth. The hood of the car flies up just before Verrazano. My form, a video game. It could happen again. It could happen all at once. My vision, my opal, swirled colored smoke from the egg. Die again, die again, again, balled up numerals, edging till you simply must, and the accelerator goes without my pressure. The fire curves blue and gasps at the archway, feline oval, water's edge. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Damn, thank you. Thank so you good. Such a cool way to. Yeah. to extend this thank you for thank you so much raul and will um please everybody will post the link one more time for company please go see the show um and thank you everyone actually at company for helping with images today um the brooklyn rail is a small nonprofit, and we do need some support um, for our operations like our daily nsc there's a link to donate in the chat um, join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Um, for a conversation with Samantha Nye on her new show. Um, she'll be with Ksenia Sabolova, so, um, and we'll conclude with a poetry reading by Dia Felix. And please, uh, you can turn your microphones on to say goodbye as you leave. Thank you all so much for, you, for being here. Thank you. Thank you for such a Thank you. conversation. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Bye, bye. Congratulations on the good Thank show. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, go see the show before going. <laughs> Please do in your own account. Wise up. Loco. <laughs> loco. Yeah, loco. <laughs> oh, for the beautiful reading. Yes. Thank you, Chorus. So Thank, yeah. Thank you. Guys. Enjoy your day, you guys. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy your day. Happy Monday. Congratulations. Happy Monday. <laughs> Let's go have lunch. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.